I'm Eric Strong from the Palo Alto Veterans Hospital and Stanford University. This is the second lecture in this lecture series on mechanical ventilation, and the topic is normal lung mechanics. Here are the learning objectives of this lecture. First, to be able to define and understand the relationship between various lung volumes. And second, to understand the basic physiology of lung compliance and airway resistance. You will soon see that this lecture will present um, a number of mathematical equations which may intimidate the medical trainee. Uh, however, rote memorization of these equations is not nearly as important or helpful as will be an understanding of how to apply them in managing the respiratory status of patients on mechanical ventilators. The first physiologic principle to discuss is the definition of some important lung volumes. Here we have a graph of lung volume as a function of time. Each undulation in the curve represents a breath in a spontaneously breathing patient. We can see that most breaths are relatively shallow and constant, which is consistent with a normal respiratory pattern in a healthy person. The volume of gas cycled with each normal breath, or the amplitude of this curve, is termed the tidal volume. It is approximately 500 milliliters in an average size adult. Next, you will note that the third breath in the graph is substantially larger. Here, the patient was asked to take in as deep an inspiration as possible, the additional volume of air that the lungs could accommodate beyond the tidal volume is known as the inspiratory reserve volume. Then the patient is asked to exhale as completely as possible. The additional volume of air expelled beyond the tidal volume is known as the expiratory reserve volume. However, even at a person's maximal expiration, when he or she has pushed out every milliliter of air they possibly can, there will always exist some residual amount of air in the alveoli uh, and the uh, air passages, and this is called the residual volume. In addition to the lung volumes, there are also quantities known as lung capacities. These are summations of two or more lung volumes. The sum of the inspiratory reserve volume and the tidal volume is known as the inspiratory capacity. The sum of the expiratory reserve volume and residual volume is the functional residual capacity. The functional residual capacity is a particularly important value because it represents the volume of the lung at equilibrium when the inward elastic recoil of the lung is perfectly balanced with the outward elastic recoil of the chest wall. The sum of the inspiratory reserve volume, tidal volume, and expiratory reserve volume is known as the vital capacity. And finally, the sum of all lung volumes is known as the total lung capacity. Most lung volumes are surprisingly simple to measure. A uh, device that does so is known as a spirometer. Uh, here is the original diagram of the first true spirometer invented by the British physician John Hutchinson in 1846. Uh, not only did Hutchinson invent the device, but he also was the first to recognize the possible medical importance that these measurements might have, going as far as recommending to the insurance industry in London at the time that they use vital capacity in actuarial predictions for persons selling uh, life insurance. Here is a more basic schematic of the principle on which Hutchinson's device worked, an example of a volumetric spirometer using a water bell to displace a recording device. Today, uh, tanks of water and pulley systems have been replaced with circuits and a variety of techniques to measure airflow integrated over time. Uh, standard spirometry is a able to measure tidal volume, inspiratory reserve volume, and expiratory reserve volume, but not residual volume. Measuring residual volume and thus total lung capacity requires additional equipment such as a body plethysmography chamber uh, shown here. Uh, due to the obvious practical challenges in employing such devices in the ICU, uh, measurement of residual volume is essentially never done in mechanically ventilated patients. So in summary, the easy to measure lung volumes are the inspiratory reserve volume, tidal volume, and expiratory reserve volume. The difficult to measure lung volume is the residual volume. There is an additional classification of lung volumes that is uh, more important actually for understanding mechanical ventilation, and that is the dead space volumes. Uh, dead space is the volume in the airways and lungs which do not participate in gas exchange. It is further distinguished into anatomic dead space, 
which is limited to the volume of the conducting airways not lined with the diffusing membrane, such as the trachea and bronchi. Then there is the physiologic or total dead space, which is the sum of the anatomic dead space and the volume of alveoli which are ventilated but not perfused. Anatomic dead space cannot be accurately measured short of autopsy. Um, however, physiologic dead space, which is uh, luckily much more useful, can be calculated from the Bohr equation. Uh, the Bohr equation states that the physiologic dead space is equal to the tidal volume times the difference between the partial pressure of carbon dioxide in the arteries and in expired air, all divided by the partial pressure of carbon dioxide in the arteries. The partial pressures of CO2 can be easily measured, as we will see in Lecture 5. Um, this is definitely one equation that you should not uh, bother committing to memory. Because anatomic dead space is much less important than physiologic dead space, most clinicians use the shortened term, quote, dead space, um, to refer strictly to the latter, and uh, I will adopt the same convention in these lectures. Now, a quick word about ventilation rates. These are essentially measures of volume cycled per unit time, where that unit time is by convention per minute. First is minute ventilation. This is equal to the tidal volume times the respiratory rate. A more important value, though slightly more cumbersome to work with, is the alveolar ventilation. This is a measure of the volume cycled per minute that is actively participating in gas exchange. It is calculated from multiplying the difference between the tidal volume and the dead space by the respiratory rate. These are two equations you should actually try to remember. For those of you not familiar with the dot notation, uh, whenever you see a dot over top a variable, it alters the meaning of the variable such that it is now a measure of how that variable changes with time. So in other words, a dot over a V refers to a rate of volume exchange uh, or uh, volume per unit time. And uh, this notation will be used periodically in subsequent lectures. I will now move on to discuss lung compliance. The compliance of any enclosed space, be it the lung, the heart, or a hot air balloon, uh, is a measure of how the volume of that space changes with changes in pressure. Here's a simple diagram of the forces responsible for compliance within the respiratory system. First, there is the inward elastic recoil of the lung. There's also the outward elastic recoil of the chest wall. Um, as mentioned in lecture one, these two opposing forces create a negative pressure within the pleural space. Uh, the difference between this negative intrapleural pressure and the intraalveolar pressure is known as the transpulmonary pressure. And it is actually this uh, transpulmonary pressure that drives changes in lung volume that we uh, briefly went over in the last lecture. This is a graph of lung volume as a function of transpulmonary pressure. Let's start at the functional residual capacity, which if you remember is the respiratory system's natural equilibrium point. If the diaphragm then descends, triggering an inspiration, we can see that the volume will increase. Then the diaphragm relaxes and the lungs recoil back to their equilibrium state, leading to expiration. The compliance of the lungs at a particular pressure or volume is equal to the slope of the curve at that point. You may have already noted that the inspiratory and expiratory curves are different. Uh, this effect is known as a hysteresis and is predominantly due to the increased force needed during inspiration to recruit and inflate alveoli. Let's take a look at how lung compliance changes in two prototypical pathologic conditions. For simplicity, we will look at compliance during the expiratory phase of respiration. First, in pulmonary fibrosis, the fibrotic changes make the lung stiffer, so therefore the slope of the compliance curve is less. You will also notice that because the lungs are less compliant, they are less affected by the chest wall's outward elastic pull, and therefore the FRC is lower. Therefore, patients with pulmonary fibrosis tend to breathe at lower lung volumes. In contrast to this is the situation with emphysema, in this condition, a loss of elastic fibers leads to an increase in compliance. Due to the high compliance of the lungs, the chest wall's outward pull is relatively stronger 
than the inward elastic recoil of the lungs. Uh, therefore, patients with emphysema have higher FRCs and breathe at higher lung volumes. As you will see in later lectures, understanding these pathologic changes in compliance uh, is actually pretty important in establishing proper ventilator settings and in troubleshooting when airway pressures become dangerously high. In addition to compliance, the other major metric of lung mechanics in the mechanically ventilated patient is airway resistance. Airway resistance is related to airflow and the pressure gradient as follows. Flow is equal to the pressure gradient divided by the resistance. According to Poussier's law, the resistance to the flow of gas in a tube equal to eight times the viscosity times the length of the tube divided by pi and the tube's radius raised to the fourth power. Please do not bother memorizing this equation, except to remember the key point that resistance to airflow is inversely proportional to the fourth power of the radius. Therefore, very small quantitative changes in the radius can have significant impact on resistance. One might be tempted to conclude from the profound effect of airway radius on airflow resistance that the terminal bronchioles are the site of the greatest total resistance in the respiratory system. However, there are so many terminal bronchioles in parallel that the net cross-sectional area is sufficient to balance out their diminutive size. Therefore, the site of greatest airflow resistance is actually the medium-sized bronchi, seen here in yellow. Airway radius can be impacted by a number of factors, most obviously during exacerbations of asthma or COPD or during anaphylaxis, all of which can lead to acute narrowing of the airways. However, there are two general physiologic processes which can impact airway resistance in the absence of primary pulmonary disease. The more prominent of these processes is the effect of the autonomic nervous system. So sympathetic stimulation via beta-2 receptors relaxes bronchial smooth muscle, leading to bronchial dilation and decreased resistance. Conversely, parasympathetic stimulation of muscarinic receptors leads to bronchoconstriction and increased resistance. The second less prominent physiologic process is related to lung volume. Uh, at higher lung volumes, radial traction exerted on the bronchi and bronchioles pulls the airways outward, leading to decreased resistance. Um, at lower lung volumes, when the outward radial traction on the airways is less, their natural elastic recoil takes over, leading to a decreased radius and thus increased resistance. I hope you found this lecture on normal lung mechanics to be both interesting and useful. Continue to lecture three on monitoring lung mechanics, where we will see how to apply everything that we learned in this lecture.